Sometimes happiness means living up to our values even when it makes us feel bad. Gretchen Rubin. Are you ready to make the most of the only life you have? To make smart money choices focused on achieving what you care about most? Here to help you balance living well today without sacrificing your tomorrow is the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. Well, we are about done with Lori and Bruce's Retirement Plan Live case study. It's been an interesting one. They've been a little unusual relative to the other ones, and it's caused a lot of great email interactions and reaction from you about their spending and other things. So we're going to meet Lori and Bruce this coming Monday, November 27th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for the live Retirement Plan Live webinar, where we're going to walk through their entire plan with them and see how it turns out. If you'd like to participate live, you're going to have to register via Six Shot Saturday emails. If you haven't already, sign up for it at rogerwhitney.com. There's boxes all over the place about how to get the Six Shot Saturday email because that's where you're going to get the registration. So if you sign up and join us live, here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet Lori and Bruce, and then we're going to review their ideal retirement, walk through it with them, and look at their financial resources, and then dive into my analysis as to whether it's possible or probable that they can achieve that retirement. Now, if it's not, and in many cases it's not, then we're going to have to talk with them and have them prioritize and negotiate a solution that looks achievable based on the analysis. And then once we get to that workable solution, we're going to have to stress test the plan. And we're going to do this on the webinar. We're going to analyze, okay, what's the impact if we have a 2008 market meltdown again right at the beginning of retirement. How does that impact the plan? What happens if someone dies early? What happens to the surviving spouse? What happens if we have rampant inflation? We're going to test on what happens if there's a long-term care event later in life that could suck a lot of financial assets. We're going to stress test the workable plan to see the impact of all of this live on the webinar. So if you want to participate live, you're going to have to register and the link will be in this week's Six Shot Saturday. Before we do any of that, and before we get to the rest of the show, we got to have that all important disclaimer. I am constantly reading resources on the internet and on podcasts, listening to them. But I'm guessing you probably do that too. If I'm not feeling healthy, I'll go read some nutritional information or some information on stretching. That's what I've been focused on lately because I've been trying to get into yoga. And I can find yoga videos and articles that tell me exactly how to do it. And I think that happens a lot even in the financial realm. If we're worried about savings or doing a budget, the first thing we're going to do is Google it and either listen to a podcast or read an article that gives us, quote unquote, advice on what we should do in our own life. Here's the thing. None of these people know anything about us. So they're giving helpful hints and education, but I would be very careful before you take advice from someone that doesn't understand your particular situation. And that definitely goes with the show, right? So I only give you helpful hints and education. Don't take advice from me. I only give advice to clients. Before you make any decisions based on what you hear, hear, talk to people that know you, like your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor. That's really common sense. In the hot topic today, I want to focus on what I hear most often people want for their pre-retirement and retirement years. You know, yeah, it looks like the brochures a lot of times, but it really comes down to the acronym FORM. All right. The M in form, the last letter stands for money. They want to be secure from a money standpoint. But I want to focus today on the F-O-R of that acronym. So the F stands for family and friends. One of the most common things I hear is, you know, Roger, I just want to have some time freedom so I can spend time with my spouse and with my friends and with my children and my grandchildren and enjoy them and create some shared experiences. I hear that all the time. So family is one of the big motivators 
in wanting to go into pre-retirement or retirement. Now, the second letter of form, the O, stands for occupation. Now, that can involve work for money, but what I hear a lot is, Roger, I want to have the time and the freedom to pursue something of interest to me, to work on something, whether it's a hobby or for money, that I really enjoy, something that I've wanted to pursue for years that I think is my calling to occupy my time. In many cases, I have clients that will have lists of 10 things that they've been waiting to pursue once they enter pre-retirement or retirement. So I think that goes against the face of a lot of things of, look, we want to have an occupation in retirement. We just want to have the occupation that really jazzes us, that fits who we've discovered that we are and what our talents and passions are. So first we have family, the F, family and friends. Then we have our occupation, something that we want to pursue that's meaningful to us. And then lastly, we have the R, which is recreation, right? That's the fun. That's the excitement of mountain biking or traveling. Traveling tends to be a big R want, wanting to go experience the country or the world together. Now, the reason I bring this up is if we want to spend time with family and friends, and if we want to have an occupation, something that's meaningful for us that we're doing, and if one of the biggest recreational desires is to travel in some way, I think a good question for us to ponder is how can we combine all three of those family and friends, occupation and purpose, and travel, recreation? How can we combine all of those to create some pretty meaningful experiences in our pre retirement and retirement years? Well, That's what I want to talk about in today's practical planning segment with a good friend. So in today's practical planning segment today, I want to focus on how we can combine those four things, family, occupation, and recreation to create some meaningful experiences. And a good friend of mine, Chris Niemeyer, is the founder of Mission Travel. He founded it in 2006. Now, Chris loves to travel, and he's been to over 30 countries and has about 100 plus countries on his bucket list. And here's the cool thing. He and his wife have four young children, and they involve them on many of these trips. So Chris has a extensive experience, not just traveling internationally and domestically with family, but he has a lot of experience in doing it with a purpose behind it. In his case, mission trips but it doesn't have to be a Christian-based mission type of thing. It can be anything, as we discuss. So he has a lot of experience not just doing this, but organizing and helping people figure out the path to do it themselves as well. So let's have a conversation with Chris on how we can take our travel, our family, and our desire for purpose to the next level during retirement with purpose-based travel. All right, so Chris, this last spring... My wife and I, we went to Turks and Caicos, (laughs) pre-hurricane. And we sat on the beach. We had Vespas and we rode around on the wrong side of the road. And it was about a week trip. And it was a blast. There was no real purpose to it other than a blast. And I've never actually been on a travel trip where there was another purpose other than travel. So my question to you to start is, what am I missing? Mm, Well, that's a good question. And I got to tell you, I love those kind of trips as well. Sometimes a trip just to meander and explore and relax is also really, really good to do. So I definitely come from a world in this missions space, right? Where we talk about rolling up our sleeves and getting dirty and helping other people. But it's even beyond that. It doesn't have to be this just Christian missions focused. There's a lot of people out there these days that have been to a lot of places. They've been tourists at all-inclusive resorts. They've been on cruise ships. And they're looking for more, you know, more of an experience. What's the culture really like? What are the people really like? If I were to get out of my four or five star resort and go to the local, you know, wherever it's local restaurant or I mean, one thing we do as a family, we always try in any country we go to, especially third world, we always try to take public transportation just to experience what it's like to be a local, right? I mean, I've been on places where it's like the lady's got a couple of chickens in her lap next to me. And that's just cool, right? I mean, it's getting to see a, a glimpse of what and how other people live, I think is something that we're missing probably a little bit in our North American culture of what we term travel. You know, something I, I travel has always just inspired me. And 
I'm a guy, I, I love quotes, right? I just, whether well, it's about travel or right? any other places, but you know, there's one I think a lot of people have heard by St. Augustine. It says, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only a page. That is a good quote. And you're right about travel because when I think of my wife and I, we've been married 27 years, our travel. Now, I tend to do more exploratory travel when I'm going on my adventure trips. But the last, I remember one time, uh, I think we were in London and we're walking through a mall like thing. And I'm like, well, this just looks exactly like a mall in Dallas, Fort Worth. You know, I didn't have to fly all the way over here to go do that. And it's easy to get trapped in that when we travel, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's familiar. It's It's familiar. Yeah. And that's part of it, just getting outside your comfort zone, right? I mean, I think the whole idea of travel, and and travel's changed a lot too, Roger. I mean, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when travel was not as accessible, you know, even going to the airport was an experience. I mean, flying on an airplane 30 years ago was actually really cool. And people dressed up to the nines. They were, you know, getting hot dishes served to them by stewardesses who are actually nice to them. <laughs> if you've been a, and I know you travel, so you've been to airports recently, it's, it's just not a pleasant experience anymore necessarily. But I think it's because travel has become so accessible and we're used to going and especially, in, this is a generalization, but especially in America, we've got our Caribbean and Mexico and Hawaii and it's just all there, right? It's just all accessible and travel has kind of become a, a bit of a commodity. And so it takes a little bit more effort, takes a little more you know, experience in trying to find ways to do travel where you're, you're doing something where you're either you're giving back or you're being intentional about understanding the educational aspects of it. Like we just got back last month. My wife had a big birthday. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got back for a couple, again. couple weeks in Greece and you know, it's in October. We homeschool, hack school, we call it. So we had, you know, kids are with us and and it's, it's a place where she's always wanted to go, right? She just always wanted to spend on a bucket list of hers. And so now we'd been there several years ago on a cruise ship and stopped up a few places, but didn't really get a, a good sense of what it was like. So we spent you know, a few weeks and we were, we were intentional about even leading up to the trip of some of the schooling stuff we were doing with the kids. Like whatever they're reading about or from math and culture and everything, it was like, let's understand how, how does Greek culture and Greek history even influence what we do now? I mean, just from the alphabet to Olympics to, you know, whatever. And so, and we had, you know, we bought some CDs that we could bring with us while we're driving around and learn about, you know, the Greek history. And so it was awesome for my kids to be able to like literally drive around these, you know, little towns and hear about this particular island and how, you know, the Spartans were pillaging here. And just, it just opens up a whole new level, a new layer, I guess, when you're traveling and you're being intentional about learning about that kind of culture and just sitting down like in little cafes and like talking to the locals or, you know, it's easy. I think when you have kids too, to bring that into the equation and bring a little soccer ball and Hey, just they're great icebreakers. On, on some wine here. Yeah, they're great yeah, icebreakers. Right? They, can, they don't have any any filters at all. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I want to break this down into two separate levels then. So the first level is traveling local, I guess is what I'll call it, right? Traveling someplace and getting beyond looking. I mean, you want to go see, you know, the beautiful sites that are, you know, make people want to go there, the Parthenon and things like that. But getting beyond that layer to really getting a feel for the culture and the local aspect of it. So what are some of your top tips for doing that? So I would definitely do a lot of research up front in terms of finding ways, you know, yes, you can hop on most all the travel websites and photos and frommers and all those to give you some overview tips on the areas. But I mean, even just a practical thing, go on Yelp or some equivalent of that beforehand and type in top local places that the locals eat at. You know, it doesn't have to be this thing that's in Michelin rated. It could be just be like a local shop. You know, uh, I mean, some of the times we've gone in places where we hear about it and you walk in the door and it's like, there's maybe a carcass of some sort hanging and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what, where are we getting into? But you know, you go through and in the back, there's this awesome little cafe and it's, it's just people. They're not even necessarily catering to tourists. This is just where the locals go to to hang out. I mean, we took our, I guess at the time he was about two years old, took our son to Italy with us. And man, the people there just latch on to kids. And so we would just every night you you go and walk around and you're at coffee shops or gelaterias and these old guys that are smoking a cigar or playing chess, you know, they they just have our son come up and say hi. And, you know, just kind of trying to figure out what's the local flavor like. Are they known for like Italy is a good example. Italy is known for going out on walks after dinner and just 
talking and walking and that's just part of what they do. And so we would just try to do that. Now, do you typically stay at a normal kind of hotel when you travel? We like to mix it up. So we do the... My wife's got a decent appetite for things like that. So we'll stay at some nice hotels, but we'll also stay at you know places that are pretty normal, like apartment style, Airbnbs. In fact, in Italy, we did, we did that in, at an Airbnb and it was just great because it's like literally people next door are hanging their laundry. And so we're trying to talk with them and they want to practice English. And so we're, you know, we're doing that, you know, this past trip to Greece. And by the way, this is another tip. So take a look at when the places have peak seasons and try to go in the, what's called shoulder season. So shoulder season is usually just after your peak season. So for Greece and Mediterranean, right? It's very typical that summer is your peak season. That's when Europeans travel. That's when Americans are coming over. And so, you know, we intentionally booked just after that. And at the first couple of weeks of October, because the weather's still good, Everything's still open, but they're getting some discounts and deals usually. And so we were able to stay in some nicer accommodations for a, a better price. And actually, you know, one quick story there, we were intentional about one thing in particular that turned out awesome, like beyond our imagination. So we wanted to do... We've been to Santorini before and love Santorini. And we're there and we decided, you know what? It'd be cool to go on a little catamaran tour, a little half day, you know, six hour catamaran tour. And so we waited until the day before we're going to do it. And they've got these brochures, right? You can get on the... 55 foot catamaran with you know 50 people for X price. But if you pay a little bit more, you can get on just about the same size. I think it was a 47 foot cat, but it was a semi private and it was only going to, it was listed as only going to be up to 12 people. So we had a family of six, right? So we're a large family. So we decided let's pay a little bit more and we'll book this private or semi private tour in hopes that, you know, it would be leaving less than 12 people. So we get there the next day, right? We get picked up from our hotel, we drive down to the marina. There's a couple different cats coming in. There's probably 75 people waiting on the pier in just two different groups. And our guy gets out. He checks us in. Hey, the Niemeyer family's here. Catamaran pulls up and we board. We're the first ones on. And as soon as we finished boarding, they put the tie off behind us. And they're like, okay, you guys are ready to go. And it was just our family on this private catamaran adventure for the entire you know, day. We had the skipper to ourselves. There were you know four other staff there. And so we just kind of got to customize what we could do because we kind of hacked the shoulder season, if you will. So that's a practical tip to look into is when are peak seasons, when are our shoulder seasons, because we get some good values out yeah, of that. Yeah. And literally a week or two apart can mean a lot of money savings. Totally. Right. And totally. especially for people in that listen to this show that have more life freedom than most people do. Yeah. Get a better idea. Yeah. Flexibility of time is good. Okay. Now let's factor in the purpose part of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we can call it mission trip. We can just call it purpose driven. Obviously, there's a benefit that you're going to help someone, but talk about the benefit of having that experience factored into it. So I can think of a trip in particular and a story. Last year, last September, we took our staff down to Peru and we split the trip up. It was just over a week. And so we had some time as team building. We do this annual retreat every year. We had our tourist days. We climbed Machu Picchu together. And then the last three days, we stayed at an orphanage. So one of my staff members actually works half the year in Peru as kind of a full-time missionary, if you will. And so he knows the area really well. And he's been engaged with this particular orphanage and church. And so, so we got to go there. And again, we took our kids which by the way, some people say we're absolutely crazy, but it's just, it is what it is. Like, we just, we roll like that. So, but we took our kids and here was the cool thing to answer your question about how it impacts them, but also you is, you know, we got to see our kids just be kids with these other orphan kids. And, and we explained to them, you know, you know, beforehand, Hey, these are people that for whatever reason, you know, mom or dad's not in their life anymore. And so just kind of had to explain the rawness of that to, and then our kids are at the time where, you know, seven and five and three and then a baby. And so it was just beautiful to watch even our two boys in particular who are just, you know, they're the older ones and they're the kind of athletic and to just roll up their sleeves and make kites out of literally garbage. I mean, we went to like this little garbage dump area and they found string and they found plastic bags and they collected sticks and they figured out how to make a kite together. And you know, they attached to some boys that were trying to learn some English. And so they got to speak a little bit and they played a lot of soccer together. And here's the story that just sticks in my mind every time is we're leaving with our whole team in this, you know, 12 passenger van. We're leaving this orphanage, heading back to the airport. And of course we'd shopped for the and little knickknacks and things along the way as little tour souvenirs. But my little seven-year-old turns, he's in the front seat, he turns back and he says, he says, mom and dad, you know, what would be the coolest thing to bring back from Peru. We said, what's that, Jesse? And uh, 
get teared up just thinking about it. But he says, my friend Mario, his little friend Mario that he met there and just attached to. And it's like, that's the beauty of really engaging people, not just going to go and be a tourist, but really engaging people in a way that you're being affected, right? I mean, we thought, hey, here we're going and we're bringing down donations and we're doing stuff like that, which is all well and good. But to just be and to show up and just be yourself and connect with other people, I mean, that's those are the kind of impacts that I love about purposeful travel. And it definitely gets you beyond the headlines of a region when you actually know people there and get to see, yeah. you know, they're not that different. Totally, totally. And they, you know, my kids are pretty well traveled. I mean, they've, they've seen a lot of the world already. And that's still one of those trips that they talk about. Like, oh, we need to go back to the orphanage. I'm going to play soccer with Mario again. You know, just cool stuff like that. So. so let me ask you, as a man who's never gone on a trip with purpose, and one, I like that you pointed out it doesn't have to be all or none. You can break it up. So you do get to see the highlights and everything else, but you work in the purpose part of it as well. But for someone who's never done a trip like that, they may not be connected to an organization or a church that organizes such things. Mm -hmm. One, how do you do that? How do you find the opportunity? How do you get comfortable with going someplace that is very outside your ballywick and create something where you get a little bit of everything? So, you know, again, it go back to some research, right? So I mean, you definitely want to understand the country and then just literally just start Googling some places that you would want to do. I mean, some people are attached to orphanages. Some people would be attached to animal shelters or, you know, you fill in the blank. You know, I'm bummed. Two years ago, there was an actual cruise line that had an every other week cruise. It was called Fathom Cruises. Fathom was, their tagline was impact travel. And they, every other week would go down to the Dominican Republic and it would be a day and a half sailing down. You'd spend three and a half days there in port. And every day you'd have opportunities to go and do some cool stuff. And I've got some stories about that that are pretty awesome. But just being intentional, even on this cruise down of understanding the culture, understanding the people, how to talk to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, they ceased operations, but they're under the Carnival brand and Carnival still wants to keep that going. And so they have shore excursions on their normal cruise ships. And you're still on a cruise, you're still doing what you're doing and just relaxing, but they've got opportunities when you're in port if you want to go and connect with this organization that sets up a day where instead of zip lining or sit on the beach, you can go and help put a well in a little village, or you can go and like one thing we did was actually lay cement floors on these dirt huts. I mean, most people live in these dirt huts, little shanties, but they have not even the privilege of a hardwood floor. And so there are organizations out there like that. What's called in our industry, volunteerism. If people were just to look at volunteerism and you're just Googling that, they'll find some opportunities out there in different countries that really provide that. They provide the best of both. You can still go and do your touristy thing, hit the highlights, but have opportunities you know, to give back and share as a family. To me, that's one thing I'm passionate about is getting multi-generational families together to go. I mean, there's, you know, there's all these studies out there, but I mean, 80% of the time you spend with your kids is before they turn 18. After they're out of the house, you don't really have a whole lot of time left with them, even though they're going to live you know, a long time. So what kind of things are we doing as a family to share the world with them? And, and that's a great point if you think of, you know, because if you're my generation and you didn't grow up in that environment, you know, my kids are 20, 21, well, you sort of miss that, right? My 80% is mm-hmm. gone. Not totally. Right. But, and a lot of boomers may feel that way. And I don't know if they do or not, but it could also be the grandparent grandchild relationship. You know, if you, you know, so I think of, you know, my grandpa, I'd go to his house and we'd just hang out and, you know, maybe take me to a diner or something. And those are great experiences, but I can imagine the impact that could be had of grandpa and grandson or granddaughter are going on something like this. You get more depth of the shared experiences that you get to pass on to the grandchildren if you really feel like you've never done it or you missed the chance with your kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just that common bond of a shared experience where, you know, you can go back and recall what the things were like or, oh, but do you remember that story that we had and shared and, you know, whether you're on a cruise or at some country? I mean, those are the kind of things I think leave impressions, especially on kids. We're such a consumerism type culture that it's always about stuff. But I'm loving hearing stories about people that are saying, you know what, for Christmas this year, for birthdays, we might do it with toy, but we're going to set up a travel account for us as a family. And really put that aside, earmark some money specifically to say, 
we're going to go somewhere as a family and maybe it's inviting the grandparents or whomever, but just being intentional about that experience together. Now, an important point here too that I think gets missed is this can all be domestic. Totally. That's true. This could be domestic of if you want to see the country, like my wife wants, you know, it's not my dream necessarily, but it's hers right now of, you know, that whole classic RV trip around the, you know, the country when you're retired. <laughs> yes. And I know a few people and have some clients that do that where they travel domestically, but they work in meeting people in different parts of the country and serving along with it too. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And there's so much out there just in our back door that you can, you can serve. I mean, Habitat for Humanity has opportunities in almost every major city in America. There's just so much out there. I mean, you know, one thing too, and especially probably for your listeners is I think it's over half, over half of American vacation days go unused every year. Really? Over half. Can you believe that? I mean, there's just a study that was, that was put out recently about this. There's some impact of like, you know, there's over $200 billion that goes wasted because there's no people traveling to spend and spur on the economy. So it's even affects our GDP when uh -huh. people aren't taking their vacation days. Well, one great resource if someone's interested in learning more about this because they've never done it or even you know getting exposed to new opportunities because and they have is your new podcast, right? So what is well, your thank show? You. What yeah. is your show? So we started, you know, Mission Travel is 12 years old and that's really a focused missions travel agency where we help individuals, churches, organizations go around the world and serve in unique ways. The Mission Trip podcast that's brand new was just launched about a week ago, actually. And that just really helps enable people, gives them ideas and insights into how to do this. Practical things in terms of if you're actually going on a trip like this and you want to fundraise or planning for a team or groups, there's just a lot of a lot of information out there. So would appreciate the listen. You bet. And we'll put links to it in the show notes. And I know you awesome. and you're the real deal. And thanks for sharing. Well, you're the real deal too, Roger. Pleasure to be on the show. Thank you. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab, where we noodle on how to live a happier life. Well, it is Thanksgiving week. 2017. So we're entering the high season of lots of family fun, but also obligations, right? We got to go visit everybody. We got to check the boxes between now, Thanksgiving and through Christmas. And that's a lot of fun, but it can also be a little stressful. And what makes us happy sometimes doesn't make us happy in the moment. And Gretchen Rubin's article which Nicole shared with me, and she's going to share in Six Shots Saturday, talks a little bit to that point of living up to our values brings us happiness and confidence about ourselves, but may not make us happy in the moment. And I struggle with this a little bit. I have a hard time with the holidays. You know, a lot of my family is deceased or spread out. So I live near my wife's family, and they're very nice, but they're not, it's just different right? They're my family and they have been for years, but they're not, you know, my growing up family. And sometimes I, it depresses me a little bit and I can feel a little bit lonely even around a lot of people that I love. And that can be hard. Plus you have the obligation of going to places that, you know, end up giving you a lot more work than truly relaxing. But here's the key. What's the point of Thanksgiving and the Christmas season? It's about being around the ones that you love, showing appreciation, and acknowledging people that are pretty important in your life, even when it means you don't get to do exactly what you want in the moment. And that's okay. So good perspective to have, I think, to have a happier holiday season. On your marks, get set. Hey, welcome to the Smart Sprint segment, where we set a seven-day action item to create a better life and a better retirement. So in the next seven days, while you are enjoying family and Thanksgiving, here's my action item for you. After Thanksgiving dinner, rather than plop on the couch and watch football or go off on your own, pull out a board game and play a game with someone that you're spending the time with. It doesn't have to be. It could be a board game. It could be a card game. The point is, be involved with the people rather than disengaging to do something more passive. That's my challenge to you. Well, on behalf of Nicole and I, we want to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. And I know that 
we are extremely happy that we get to spend this time with you every week. Seriously, this is one of the highlights of our week and of my life. And I appreciate you. I hope you and your family are well. I'm looking forward to talking with you on Monday the 27th for the Retirement Plan Live results webinar. Be well. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.